Well, thank you, Roger. It's really great to be here today. As, as you know, my name is Tim Schofield, and I've been uh, running Your Tech Simplified for about six and a half years now, uh, and working with Google, closely with Google as a YouTube partner. Now, this is a little different for me. Normally, I'm used to sitting in front of a camera talking. I can make mistakes, edit them out. Um, I guess I don't really get that option. Here. So thank you guys for being here. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thanks to Roger and everyone working with me and UC Denver for having me out here. And Daniel's fun as well for setting this all up. Now, um, for my business, started simply with a YouTube channel at the beginning. Um, it's grown into a website as well and various social media channels such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and even Google Plus. And yes, people still do use Google Plus. Um, <clears throat> so as of today, um, my video content is mainly unboxing videos, reviews on just any various technology product, including cell phones, tablets, laptops, you name it, anything tech related. At the moment, I have a little over 380,000 subscribers on YouTube and combined video views of over 100 million. Um, I also uh, started with the YouTube channel, grew to social media, have a substantial following from those YouTube viewers. Uh, I've worked with companies such as Samsung, LG, Intel, HP, just to give you an example. So today I'm here to discuss ethics in the social space. And this career really didn't exist 10 years ago. I mean, believe it or not, YouTube was developed in 2005. So not really that long ago. Uh, so it's really important to set a precedence in terms of ethics within this field because it's something that really hasn't been talked about before. And that's kind of why I'm here today. Start a dialogue with young business professionals like yourselves, uh, people that just are very unfamiliar with this field and how you can make money and how you actually turn this into a career. Um, and this is not just something that's relevant on YouTube alone. This is clearly in just the social space as well. So whether you're an Instagram model, whether you're a chef, on Facebook or you just have a popular Twitter account and you tweet, uh, ethics play a key role and you really have, if you're an influencer, you have a moral code to uphold. So before I get into that, I wanna tell you about a little bit about myself, give you some context for my business, how I got started. So I was born in Batavia, Illinois, just outside Chicago, and I do currently live in the city of Chicago. I've been there for about three, four years now. I graduated from Judson University, which is just outside Chicago as well. I studied business management there, which was very helpful in kind of changing my view of seeing my YouTube channel as more than just a hobby and turning it into more of a career. Uh, and while at Judson, I played golf there on scholarship. Uh, so between going to class, going to practice, I found time to just kind of go in my room and shoot some random videos. Um, it is, I actually am a little bummed out. I was hoping to play some golf while I'm out here. I hear at this altitude, the ball will fly a little further. So I would not complain about uh, some extra yards on my drive, that's for sure. Um, but anyways, my channel did begin as a hobby. I just completely did it for fun and had no idea where it would go and that there could actually be money involved in this. <clears throat> so at that time, it was, this is actually just a bit of a side note. If you're interested at all in starting some sort of social channel, some YouTube, any social media, I would recommend First of all, understanding who your target audience is. And once you understand that, finding out what websites they regularly go to and forums as well. Because that's kind of how I got started. I got an Android phone a long time ago, back when phones were still getting started. They were still really bad. Battery life was terrible. Things were slow. Uh, and there were tweaks you could make to the phone that I got to make it better, whether you wanted to get better battery life or make it faster. So I would go to these forums and find these tutorials to be a little difficult. So I learned them all and then try and help other people out within these forums. And I found that I was repeating myself a lot and that got so tedious, just going through seeing the same thing over and over. So I had this idea, why not just make a YouTube video and then I can just link people to this YouTube video. And so I did that for a video, it got very popular um, and people wanted more and more of these tutorials and these videos. Um, and at a certain point I kept making videos for one phone and <laughs> I really had no idea uh, how to work video equipment. This was something that I started out just having to self, just completely self-taught. I used an old digital camera as my first camcorder and I didn't even have a tripod. So what I do is I would take this digital camera and take a shoe box and have it sitting on my desk, balance my camera in one hand on this shoe box and just hold the phone under the camera in the other. 
and those videos were terrible. They were, they were not good. I've gone back and looked at them and I just, uh, just kind of cringe a little bit when I watched them. My presentation skills were not there, but it had to start somewhere and it was just for fun, just trying to help other people out. So at the time, these videos kept growing and growing and I got off the phone. I had a phone call with Google, uh, set one up and they said, Hey, any interest in making money doing this? And I was like, yeah, of course. I'm in college. I need extra money for anything. Um, and so I, that was a no brainer for me. I said, yes, let's make some money doing this. I kind of want to explain this username here because it really doesn't make any sense. The at King 77, because if you go on any of my social channels, that is the social name. And even my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash King 77 And I can attribute this username to 13 year old me wanting to play the video game Madden online. And that's the username I chose. And of course, since it was something I just did for fun, I just transitioned that username to every account that I opened just because I didn't foresee it being a business. And now eventually I'm transitioning into your tech simplified, which has been my slogan on my website for quite a bit of time. And then of course, this is me just in a blank room, just at 10,000 subscribers. So that's kind of my early beginnings on YouTube. Um, and then, so as I, as, as I started making money, making these videos, I decided that I wanted to use that money to buy new tech products because I always have had a love for technology, started with computers, transitioned to phones once they started coming out. And this was my opportunity to try all these new products as they came out. And I could just do videos as well on them for other people and continue to grow that YouTube channel. Uh, where in the current state where my channel is now, just about every product I make a video on, I get sent for free. Uh, and that's transitioned over time from buying every product and then slowly getting companies to send me more and more. Now, the big, big question I always get, no matter who I talk to when they're like, oh, what do you do? Uh, nobody quite knows exactly how you can make money in the social space. So who here watches YouTube videos, has seen a YouTube video before? Anyone? Okay, so just about all of you guys have been on YouTube. So I'm sure you are very familiar with the pesky, unskippable ads that you have to watch before you see the video that you wanna watch or you see ad banners pop up as well. Now this is, after that conversation I had with Google, this is called the partner program. So YouTube has a partner program where if you're a part of it, you can start to monetize your videos. So what Google does is they, they sell all the ad space, they handle showing ads on your videos and everything through YouTube, and they'll split that revenue with the content creator. So you can enable ads on your videos and then get a portion of that revenue that is made through these ads. So that's one way. I also use AdSense ads, which is what it goes on YouTube videos on my website. So I can transition those AdSense ads to show up as, as banners on websites. Now there's also affiliate links. Amazon's a big one. They have a, uh, an affiliate program. I've been with Amazon for a little while now. Um, and essentially an affiliate link is if, a, if I share a link to an Amazon product and someone clicks through, buys that product, I'll get a commission on that product. So I'll get a certain percentage of that sale. Uh, so if I do actually promote a product in one of my videos and they happen to sell it on Amazon, I can use that affiliate link in my description. So when they click on it, I can also kind of stack that amount of money made through those affiliate links. And they do have other websites such as share a sale referral candy uh, that you can set up affiliate links with individual companies, which I've done in the past. Now the big one that creates the most ethical questions is sponsors. And sponsors wasn't something I really did for the first couple of years on YouTube. I strictly stuck to YouTube and the AdSense ads. Those were just my only sole way of making money, but have transitioned into getting sponsors as well. Now there's a few types of sponsors. You can get video sponsors. And this is a very basic one. It could be an unrelated product. It could be a, a product you can integrate in your content as well. So for example, if I said, oh, thanks to Pop-Tarts for sponsoring my video that would be just a video sponsor, but completely unrelated to my channel because it's technology. So why would Pop-Tarts relate? Or very recently, what I've been doing is integrating related products. So if I do an unboxing video, I've been integrating case sponsors. So case companies, because when people open up their new phone with their unboxings, they're probably gonna slap a case on it. So that's just kind of another example of how you can integrate video sponsors. Now there's also dedicated product videos. So companies will reach out to me and say, hey, we want you to show our product on your channel and we'll pay you to do so. We'll send you the product and we're going to pay you. Now this is 
another example of making money. And then I do have social posts. So on my social media, I've gotten paid to tweet about certain products. I've gotten paid to retweet things, post pictures on Instagram. So there's, those are just about all the ways I've uh, been able to monetize my platform. <clears throat> now you can imagine when products are getting sent for free for reviews and when you start getting paid for videos, there's tons of ethical questions that arise and very similar to these of the, the Daniels Fund that I talk about. <clears throat> so um, my, as a business, I need to have a code of ethics. And I, the mindset that I take when I get sponsors for videos is that I'm selling video slots and not the my specific opinion. So selling these video slots allows me to kind of set aside any personal feelings about products and just realistically look and say, okay, this is going to take my time to not only produce the video, research the product, research the company, write up scripts. There's tons of behind the scenes work that goes into making a video. Uh, and so that's what I tell companies. Companies will come to me and say, we want you to show our product on your channel. Cause they understand that my channel is a product and it's a way for them to advertise and for them to get thousands of viewers on their product. So they understand that they understand the need to actually pay for the time and effort it takes to produce a video. Um, and, and I also make sure to tell every single company I work with that no matter how much money you're going to pay me, this will not sway my opinion of this product in any way. I, will, I am willing to talk about specific features of products that they want me to point out, but I still will have my own unbiased opinion about the specific product. Now, I have in the past had companies, not any big large companies because uh, large companies know better, but startup companies, international companies that are much smaller as well have said, hey, we want to pay you to show our product off and we would appreciate it if it's a favorable review. And that's something where I'll just respond and say, no, I can't do that. That's just compromising the integrity of my channel and completely unacceptable. Uh, I also keep my content consistent regardless of who I work with, what country they're from, or the amount paid. Uh, because my, my rate for videos varies all the time. It really depends on how much work is going to have to go into it, what the type of product is. There's a bunch of variables that go into how I decide what to charge a specific company. Now, keeping this consistent and not selling my opinion is essentially how you create that honesty and trust and credibility with your viewers. And this is definitely how you have a long-term benefit. When you have that trust with your viewers, they're going to keep coming back and they know your opinion isn't getting bought. Uh, and that's essentially going to continue to grow your business and it will mean more subscribers. Now, perks versus bribes. Uh, I want to kind of talk about the difference between them because there are perks to my type of work and my line of work, believe it or not. So, of course, being sent products for free, that's a, that's a huge one. And, of course, I also get flown out to various places. I just got back from Munich not too long ago. I've been flown out to China. I go to New York all the time. I go to California all the time. And companies will pay for those flights. They'll pay for hotels. Sometimes they'll buy me meals, they'll give, get me drinks. I'll go to tech conferences all the time. I go to a tech conference called CES in Vegas every year, every January. And there's tons of happy hours that companies set up, they host. You go there, you can eat and drink for free. Now these are obviously perk job perks. They're, they're great to have. However, you need to kind of see them as a benefit to the business. And that's, that's what I see them as. So when I go to trips, a lot of times it's correlated with a product launch. So if I go to New York, they'll launch a new phone or something and I'll do, be able to promote that product and do coverage on it for my fans. So that's a perk to that. Also building relationships with these companies, being flown out to various places you work with these companies. So it allows you to kind of get a more personal connection than just talking to them on the phone or emailing back and forth with them. And even the happy hours, it, it allows you to network and coordinate with other influencers. I've met a, a great group of other influencers that I see at other tech conferences, and we all the time go get, go get drinks, we get food, we, we, we hang out and we help each other out in any way we can. Now, the key of these perks is to not let them affect your opinions in any way of whatever company is providing you with a flight or a company that's even just buying you a meal. It really doesn't matter because that's when it turns into a bribe. If I said, oh, this is awesome that a company's flying me out to, to Germany and 
letting me do coverage on their product. I'm going to say very good things about their product. That's when it starts to turn into a bribe. And that really does compromise your integrity as an influencer. Now, not only do you need to do these things for your business and just for your, your personal integrity, it's actually the law. Now the United States has something called the federal trade commission and uh, their slogan, even on their website says we promote, uh, we protect the consumers and promote competition. So the FTC is the one that has set the laws for influencers. And very recently they sent out about 90 letters to various Instagram influencers saying, Hey, we know that you're promoting products and getting paid to promote these products, but you're not disclosing it to your audience. And this was the first time the FTC actually took action towards any influencer whatsoever. And uh, this kind of opened my eyes a little bit and made me realize I need to familiarize myself with the FTC law because obviously I don't want the FTC coming after me in any way. Um, so uh, luckily I was actually in Munich about a month ago and I met someone named uh, Glenn Gilmore and he is a Forbes top 25 social media influencer. He's also a lawyer. So he was very interested in this FTC law with influencers. It gave me a lot of great insight. He had an awesome LinkedIn post kind of summarizing the FTC's guidelines because they, FTC understands it's kind of up in the air what you need to do. So FTC has really spelled it out for influencers. First of all, the main key is to be transparent. That's the biggest one. You just need your viewers to know if you're getting paid to promote a specific product. So that's the end goal. Now ways you can do that is through hashtags. So if you're on social media, you can use hashtag ad, sponsored, paid. Those are three approved by the FTC uh, and they cannot be ambiguous. So you can't use hashtag collab or hashtag ambassador because those are something you're not 100% sure if someone's get, actually getting paid for that. And those are a little bit too ambiguous and it's not obvious to your, to your viewer that you're actually getting paid. Now also there's uh, on Instagram, if you use a certain amount of lines of text, you, there's a more button that pops up to show the rest of the text. Uh, you're not allowed to put hashtag ad or anything under that more, that more section. Now the FTC has also uh, talked about international influencers. So not just in the United States, if you're an influencer outside the United States, maybe you're in Spain and you have a strong following on Instagram. If you're viewers, if you affect us consumers, you have to follow these FTC laws. That is, spelled out by them. I'm not exactly sure how the FTC is going to enforce that to someone in a different country, but they have actually uh, even talked about it. <clears throat> now, anyways, I'm just in a current, currently in a very rare position to influence a lot of people. And that's really not something that needs to be, uh, that should be taken lightly. So last year I got invited to Google's office in Chicago. Google invited me out there for a Q and a session with a group of local and the, the topic of conversation was to discuss the benefits of advertising through YouTube um, and a big topic. And this wasn't a paid opportunity. This was something that I saw as a benefit to myself to kind of network with Google employees. And then obviously the more people wanting to bid on ads on YouTube, the higher the price goes and the more money the content creator can make. So anyways, the main topic of conversation with these local advertisers was the difference between YouTube and TV. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm totally uh, someone that will put on the TV and then just end up not even paying attention and be on my phone, looking at Instagram, texting, reading an article, anything like that. So my attention towards the TV really fades. I have too many things to, other things that I can pay attention to. Uh, a lot of people, when I studied back in, back in school, I would even put on the TV as white noise, just in the background, something I'm not paying attention to. I know you can, record TV and skip through ads. You can mute ads as well. So with YouTube, it's, it's a little bit different because there's a bit of a personal, there's actually a really big personal connection between your fans and your viewers, especially with your subscribers, because they continuously come back to your content to see you, see what you have to say. And they're way more focused on you because they feel that personal connection. So they're more likely going to see a specific ad that's on your video over and over because they specifically click a link to your video to see it. <clears throat> now, another side note, again, if you guys are looking at becoming popular in the social space, when I first got started on YouTube, I would respond to every single comment on my videos. And that was huge to create that, that core following. My viewers really appreciated it. And I started a lot of dialogue and met a lot of cool people through that. So 
whether I was interacting with them on social media, whether I was responding to YouTube comments, it was just another way for me to connect with them on a more personal level. And this personal connection I have with my fans is one of the most important things for me, and I really don't take it lightly. Um, so once you build the trust with your audience and they have a feel of personal connection towards you, that actually goes both ways. So it's not just them having the connection to me, it's also me connecting with them. And to give you an example, I, need, I see my fans similar to how I would treat my friends and family. So for example, I, all the time, my friends and family will come to me and say, hey, I have a problem with my phone, can you help me fix it? They come for tech advice, product recommendations, all the time. So let's say, for example, my mom comes to me and it's like, Tim, I need a new laptop. Mine broke, I need a new one. Can you recommend a good product for me? And let's say I recommend her a not so great product and it ends up breaking after a week or two and she'll get really mad. She'll call me up and say, hey, Tim, why would you recommend this product for me? Uh, you're grounded. And then just, I'll be in tons of trouble. No. Um, so uh, I do have that accountability to my friends and family. So why would I ever recommend a product to them that they wouldn't actually appreciate and wouldn't work long term and something that I would use for myself? So with that being said, that's the way I see my viewers. And if I have a sponsor on a video, I'm not going to recommend a product that I don't fully approve and fully uh, feel that I could recommend to my family and friends. And that's something I don't need to do. I could have a sponsor of just a no name product that might not work and just have them pay me. And I could say, Oh, it's sponsored by this. And that's something you can do. But I see as a brand, I don't see an advantage to that. And as a business, you really want to promote things that is going to be a positive experience for your use, uh, for your viewers. Now I find that with, through all of this and through recommending better products and these personal connections, the response of my channel and my social media is extremely positive uh, in terms of the responses are very respectful. Yeah, you'll get a random person on YouTube just trolling and saying negative things, which is fine. But, it, and I just find that overall through just being very honest with your audience, they respond in a very good way and they're very positive back to you. Now giveaways is something I wanna talk about real quick because it has been an issue on YouTube. Um, not necessarily recently, but in the past year or two, uh, some YouTubers have done giveaways and there's been problems that arise. So through giveaways, you can actually build an audience. Um, I've run giveaways and say, oh, to enter in this giveaway, you have to subscribe to me. So that's another way to build your following and gain subscribers. And I know other YouTubers in the past, they've done giveaways, selected a winner, and then just not sent out the product. Uh, the winners will come to the public and say, hey, I never received this product. There's also been ones where They've been a little misleading. They've shown a lot of a certain item and saying, I'm giving these away to a bunch of people and then only end up giving away a few. So with giveaways, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Just do what you say you're going to do. If you have a giveaway, pick a winner, send them the product. Very simple, but yet somehow an issue on YouTube. <clears throat> now, not only is it important to build a relationship with your audience and your fans, but with the companies that you work with. Um, so companies I work with, they'll sometimes hire third party public relations firms. So I work with a lot of PR firms, uh, or just in-house, uh, public relations people within companies. And as a business, um, I've gotten a lot of great responses from people I work with in the PR field saying, Oh, it's, it's really pleasant working with you. You're very professional. You don't waste our time. You respond to emails promptly. And that's, simply how you would treat any other business. You, you don't want to leave anyone hanging. You don't want to just kind of ghost them and not respond. Um, and they really do appreciate that, appreciate that. And that's what keeps them coming back to working with you. They say, oh, it was really great working with you on this previous project. You're always going to be on our list for future projects because we know you deliver and you're always prompt in your responses. Now, an example of just kind of a relation I've had with a company, uh, Verizon being one of them. And I've had a very good relationship with Verizon over the past couple of years. Um, they've sent me products for review. I've gone out to their office and they've given me a demo of their upcoming 5G network and I've tested that out. And then at a certain point, um, this had to have been maybe about four months ago, I made a video on Verizon and showed and gave an example of how Verizon throttles their data on Netflix and YouTube videos. Um, and I made a whole video about it. So this was negative towards Verizon, although I do have this great relationship with them, which is fine.
However, the fans come first, and that's something where my fans really appreciate that. And and realistically, Verizon never contacted me about it. Um, this video got shared, and it became very popular. I don't know if you guys have heard of Reddit. If you haven't, it's a uh, it's a very popular website on the internet. And essentially, people will submit images, links, videos, and people will vote on them. And this one actually got to the front page. It was one of the one of the one of the top links on Reddit. So it was very popular and Verizon never contacted me as they shouldn't because it was something that my fans needed to see. And not only that, but I've continued a very good relationship with them. So they've never, never talked to me about it. And I just recently got the new Google pixel two sent to me from them. So it's just, it's just nice because they, they understand the importance of being honest and building that relationship with them, but also putting the viewers first and understanding that, Hey, this person might not necessarily only say positive things, but also negative things. And yet it's important for, to go both ways and still send products and still keep that relationship. <clears throat> now keeping relationship with companies, you can do so. I, I work with companies all the time to negotiate deals, build contracts with them. And you really need to respect three things, NDAs, embargoes, and deadlines. So an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement. So I will get products sent to me early before the, pro, uh, the public even gets them. And normally I'll need to sign an NDA so I'm not talking to people about it or showing it off to people or posting pictures about it. There's also embargoes. So an embargo is something, it's, a, it's kind of a deadline in the future where they will send you news early, press releases early. So you have, the, have it on your mind, you can write up articles ahead of time. And then once that embargo lifts on that future date, then you can go ahead and tell the public about the information they shared with you. And deadlines, when you, when you, uh, write up these contracts, you set deadlines on when the videos are supposed to be done, when the social media posts are supposed to be done. And it's important to always meet these deadlines because companies really do respect that. If you really are always late with these videos and always not posting on time, companies just won't want to work with you in the future and it's, it'll just drop you. It's, it's just that simple. And yes, there are extenuating circumstances when you might have to extend a deadline, you might need more time with a product. And if you have that relationship with the company, they'll totally understand. And I've had companies extend deadlines for me before. <clears throat> now, a big one. Uh, I, I touched on it before, accountability with your fans and how it's similar to your friends and family. You need to treat it that way. But with accountability, during my work day, there's a lot more that goes into my job than just sitting in front of the camera, talking, and publishing a video. There's tons more, a bunch of research that goes into it, whether I'm testing out the product. I'll wake up every morning, just about every morning, and go on my phone and read technology news. Just go to various websites and try and stay as up-to-date as possible on tech news. And I, I, that's not something I need to do, but it's something that I feel is necessary to be honest with my fans and be as accountable as possible to know as much as I portray. Now, it's also important to get the news from accurate sources and make sure to fact check. So as an example of that, Sony sent me a phone not too long ago, and yes, Sony still makes phones, but they're just way more popular in international markets. And this phone that, <clears throat> excuse me, this phone that they sent me uh, has a fingerprint scanner in international models. However, they disable it when they send the phone to the United States, which really doesn't make any sense. Why would they just disable a feature that everyone wants to use? So I've read, I've read up on it and various news Sources have speculated that there's litigation going on and they're not allowed to have this fingerprint scanner in the United States, but no one actually had a source for what they were saying. It was all speculation. So what I did was I went to Sony, I contacted their PR person and I said, hey, can you please give me a statement on this? and Why exactly you don't have the fingerprint scanner? And essentially they got back to me and said, sure, uh, Sony just sees this as a business decision and it's just, the direction Sony wants to go with phones in the United States, which doesn't make sense. But I saw it as important to make sure that I kind of got the information from the horse's mouth and made sure I wasn't speculating and spreading rumors and, and false news to my viewers. Um, now, I also find it uh, important to always use the products that I review. I don't just read off the spec sheet and tell them features of the products. I make sure, especially with phones, I always put my personal SIM in each phone that I review. That way I can get an accurate uh, look at the phone, whether I'm texting, making phone calls, reading Twitter, just anything. It, a lot, using it as my personal phone is just the best way to actually get a full review out of the phone. 
now continuing on, um, it, it's really important to be very intentional about the content that I, that I put out and being aware of, like I said, those perks, being accountable to people, because I do really have a rare platform to reach thousands of people that rely on me for accurate information and just making sure I know what I'm talking about. And realistically, all of these fans have, are, are looking to make a purchasing decision and they want to do the research. Uh, so I, at the very least, owe it to them to present them accurate information and a good review just because I don't want to waste their money. They work hard to make their money. They want to make a good purchasing decision. So it's important that they're getting the right information. And, and I just have that social responsibility to do that. Uh, and, and people understand over time when they continue coming back more and more to my videos, they understand that I'm very well informed in the videos I talk about, open and transparent about all the sponsors and everything. And that's what keeps people coming back. As long as you're open with them and honest, they see that as something that they'll want to come back and keep viewing. Now, another one is uh, you could be fraudulent uh, through this. I don't want to talk about reporting purchases too much with taxes, but doing taxes is the worst. It is a solid two weeks that I dread every year. Um, reporting purchases is a big one that, that relies to, uh, that kind of relates to every single form of business because you don't want to, if I go out and buy a car and never use it for my business, I can't report that on my taxes. It's important to just accurately report purchases that genuinely relate to your business. Now, also the big one with being an influencer is including all of your income because any income, any source of revenue I have, no company takes out taxes at all. So when I make money, I'm not paying any money to the government whatsoever. Now, this is big because first of all, you need to realize you need to pay taxes on this income. Uh, there was a big problem five years ago on YouTube where a bunch of YouTubers got audited because they, the um, IRS knew that they were making money and not reporting it. So you do need to include all of your income and also setting aside the money that you're going to owe to the IRS at the end. Because if you just spend all the money that you make being an influencer, you're not going to have any money at the end to actually pay the IRS back. Um, and of course, you have so many multiple sources of income that you could kind of hide some of them if you wanted to. And that's just totally unethical. And you need to make sure that you're including everything. Now, throughout... Throughout all the time I've had on YouTube, this has been a problem for me, is people stealing uh, my content. So you can download YouTube videos. There's websites, you just paste the link of the YouTube video and just download the full video. So what people will do is download my YouTube videos and re-upload them on my channel. And the only real way I ever figure this out is because fans will message me and say, hey, is this you? And I'll click on the link they send me and it's a YouTube video of me and one of my videos, but just on a different channel. So what you have to do is you have to go through a copyright form and get it taken down. It usually takes about a day to take that video down, but it's something that has been consistent throughout the past five years. There's so many videos out there and I can, it's really difficult to just go out there and search for them and try and find them. Most of the time people will just send me links, but it's a problem on YouTube. Um, and it's something that obviously you don't want people doing. So in conclusion, uh, when you're entering in the social space, you're, you just need to realize there's a lot more ethical decisions you're going to have to make every day that you wouldn't normally think would be there, especially since it's such a new field. Companies might try and take advantage of you not really knowing, having that ethical code about your business. And there's a very, very bright future in this industry. Companies are starting to realize that you have a platform to reach thousands of people. And that's just a way that they can advertise their business and their product as well. Now, since it's rapidly growing, as I mentioned, you need to have that moral code as a business so you are re prepared and ready when these ethical uh, dilemmas arise. <clears throat> now, being transparent and open with your fans, with these companies building all these relationships, they start to respect it, and, they, and it really does benefit your business in the long run. Now, I do want to say thank you guys all for coming out. It really does mean a lot. If you would like to continue this conversation in private or just if you, you come up with questions or anything in the future, feel free to tweet at me or you can just send me an email if you'd like to. I'll get back to you and love to continue this conversation. But I know that we do have a Q&A session now, so you can open the floor to any questions as well. Go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you feel in a couple language 
can review not only with your user base, but also potential uh, um, clients or people that want to work with you. Yeah, of course. Um, for me, that's something that's always off the table. I will never use colorful language, and I keep things very GPG on my channel, just because that's my audience. Um, I find that people respect that. However, I do understand that there's an entertainment value to YouTube as well. And using these colorful languages brings in a different audience than probably my audience. Um, now, there is a problem on YouTube with uh, advertisers not wanting to advertise on some more racial or colorful channels as well, and they'll demonetize those videos. So that's kind of a risk you run, is having advertisers saying, oh, well, I don't really want to run ads on this, on this channel because I don't want my business being related to someone being extremely colorful or, or just not kind of family friendly. So for me, I see a long-term benefit to keeping things more tame on my channel and just accurately giving them the information. Yeah, you can still include entertainment value in the videos without using colorful language, but that's just not something I go to. However, I do see entertainment in that. I mean, I'll watch movies. Or YouTube videos as well. I mean, it, it, it's enjoyable sometimes. So it's it, it, there's there is a need for it. However, you do need to see it from an advertiser side and see how they might see that as something they don't want to associate their brand with. Go ahead. Um, that, uh, program, do you guys negotiate a percentage, or is it just the step by percentage? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the affiliate links with Amazon, I have no control over that. Some products are 4% commission, some are 8%. It, it varies depending on the product and Amazon sets all of that. However, when I do make more individual affiliate links with companies, you negotiate that percentage. So if you say, if I have a product I'm trying, I'm promoting on a video and they say, we'll give you 5% of any click through purchase, then you might come back and say, no, how about 10%? And that's something that through those websites, share a sale referral candy that I've used that companies can change. Generally, I have not ran into that. No, no, I, that would be more of kind of having like stake in the company, having that high of a, a referral percentage. Go ahead, back there. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Very, very good question. See the bottom right there, that little triangle? That is actually the logo I use, and that's my watermark that I have on all my videos, and that doesn't do anything. They'll just re-upload it with my watermark. It, they, they don't care. <laughs> so unfortunately, I mean, at least it gives you some sort of branding on these re-uploaded videos. That's what I've found. At least people are still seeing your logo and your brand, but overall, it doesn't deter people from re-uploading them. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is you, you submit a copyright complaint through YouTube and you send the link of the stolen video and your original YouTube link, the same video. And then they go through a manual prop review process and they'll take down the video and then they'll usually close out the, the channel. So there, there definitely is repercussions to doing so. It's just what's going to stop them from just creating a new channel and doing the same thing. So it's just a never ending cycle. And that's why it's been a problem with YouTube for, since I've started. <laughs> yeah. How many uh, subscriber fees or views do you think you should have before you start looking at monetizing your yourself with the uh, you know, you know, terminology? But yeah, influencer, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a little bit different now. Back when I first got started, there was a much higher threshold you had to pass to become a YouTube partner. I think it was around 10,000 subscribers, X number of videos, then they would consider getting you into the YouTube partner program. And then what happened is they got rid of all of those thresholds. Anyone could monetize videos once they created an account. And that goes back to the re-uploading content. That became a huge problem then because people could monetize the videos that they stole right away. Uh, but now they've upped 
those thresholds a little bit more. I, I forget exactly what the numbers are, but they're much lower than they used to be. But you need X amount of subscribers, X amount of videos on there before you can even start monetizing these videos and be entered in that YouTube partner program. Um, and I would say, I, so, so once you hit that threshold, I would say start monetizing as much as you can. Uh, it, it's definitely difficult to, because there's so many people starting YouTube channels and trying to get into the YouTube space at the moment. Um, and what I always tell people is that if you really, if you really want to get into it, you have to enjoy it. It has to be something that it's not just work. Um, because if you don't enjoy it, you can really get burned out, especially if you're not seeing the growth that you'd like to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you continually make sure that you're setting yourself apart from that same demographic of the tech reviewers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. There's so many tech reviewers out there now. Um, I find that I have a different style than a lot of them. A lot of them really focus on the video quality and getting the right shot using B-roll where they're they're doing voiceover over like some really cool panoramic shots and things like that. And they're, they're very well versed in it and they're really enjoyable to watch. Uh, my videos are a little more kind of, I feel that I try and make them as relatable as possible to the more general user. Uh, I want them to see my video and seeing me as someone similar to them and someone like, oh, this is just a person that goes, goes to work, hangs out with their friends, plays sports, just something like that, someone they can really relate to. So a lot of my videos are me talking into the camera or just me top down camera shots of a phone or of a product talking while I'm using it as opposed to me doing voiceover and B-roll nice shots, which are great. It's just a different kind of style to it. And I find that um, in my reviews, I'll include a little bit more information. My reviews are a little bit longer than a lot of other tech reviewers. They'll stick to around six, seven minutes, whereas mine can be around 10, 12 minutes. Um, so it's just a different style. And, and you, you want to have your own identity uh, when, you, when you include information, whether you're showing off comparison videos all the time. And, and, and it's important to keep consistent types of videos. So I'll consistently do an unboxing video. I might do some sort of check-in video and then a full review of a product, depending on what it is and, and what I'm doing. But it, it keeps it consistent and it keeps your users knowing what to look for on your channel. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, there's tons of analytics on YouTube. Um, you name it, you can pretty much find out about it. Uh, you can find out country, age range, gender, what traffic source they came from, where they clicked your YouTube link, whether they watched it on a cell phone, on a TV, on a tablet, on a laptop. You, may, you can pretty much check all of that. And, and, that, and you can actually use that to leverage yourself against companies if they're looking to promote a product towards a specific demographic. You can align that product with your specific demographic as well. Um, and YouTube does a great job at showing graphs and, and, and really figuring out like what type of, and even on an individual video basis, it's not just a collection of all your videos. It's you can click on one video and see what percentage of people from India watch my video versus the United States or what percentage of male versus female. So there are tons of them. And that, that's something that I've used because in learning your audience, that's a huge key on YouTube is knowing who your audience is, what age range, because for example, if you want to go back to that color, colorful language, I find that uh, channels that um, have that really go towards a more younger demographic um, and are more upbeat and really crazy. Those are just the channels that really stick to that 13 to 18 year old demographic and, and they watch those. Now my age demographic might be a little bit higher because they're a little, I, I try and keep them as professional as possible, as family friendly as possible. And, and relate to people that are probably going to purchase more expensive tech products or so maybe not a 13 year old. Uh, I mean, they, they do watch them, but that might not just be my audience. So yes, there are definitely tons of demographics that you really should use and look into to kind of utilize, um, not only leverage against companies, but understanding what type of content to put out. Yeah. 
No, that, that's, that's great. Uh, actually, when I first got started, my friends had no idea I was doing it. It was, again, just a side hobby. My family barely knew what I was doing. Like, it was just something that I did as a side hobby for fun. And I do not think the accurate way to become popular is necessarily through your family and friends. Because your family and friends, most of my friends really don't care about technology as much as I do. Uh, so they're not necessarily my viewers. They're not someone I need. Hey, it's nice. Some of them do watch my videos for sure. I know I have a couple friends watching the live stream. Hey guys, but um, <laughs> but but that's a very small percentage of of my family and friends. So it's nice when they do support you, but you should not rely on them to always support you because they're really not enjoying it. They're just doing it because they they care about you in general. So uh, when you first get started, you, you need to know the niche audience demographic that's going to be watching your videos because your family and friends can only go so far. And, and your family and friends are probably friends with similar people to them. And if they're not interested in, their friends are most likely not going to be interested in it either. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly, yeah, I, I never share any, mostly any of my work-related things on Facebook or any of my personal channels. <laughs> I would, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that. It's, it's totally fine to be open and honest with them, but don't continuously push things onto them. Let them come to you and be interested in your content, and then that kind of weeds out who you should actually share things with and relate to. <laughs> Um, I would always send it back. If I don't do content on it, I'll always send it back because I just kind of see as if they're going to send me some sort of product, I kind of have that accountability to make push out content, whether you even just post a picture on social media or something. Um, and most, I, I've really never had that happen. I've, they've sent me products and I've always done some sort of content on it. But realistically, if I wasn't planning on doing any sort of coverage on it, I would definitely send it back. Can you base some of your niche off of your Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so are you leaning towards someone like yourself? Oh, okay. Uh, not necessarily, no. Uh, I, I would say maybe the same sort of passion for technology for sure. Um, but age-wise, not necessarily. Um, it's, it's really just, it, it, it pretty much all stemmed out from the technology and just being interested in trying new tech products and being able to get access to these products early. And I think that's kind of my core fan base is people that really uh, are into learning about the new phones that come out, learn about the new computers and TVs that are coming out and stay up to date with the most recent technology. And there is a big fan base in, in that. And so I just kind of transitioned my passion for technology into my videos and it translates to a, a wide range of an audience and not necessarily the exact same type of person that I am. Cause I know a big, uh, there's audience that I, I'm really big into sports. A bunch of my audience isn't necessarily into sports, um, but I don't necessarily integrate sports into my videos so I keep that separate. So I, I mainly stick to just my passion for technology and don't, and I keep my personal life separate. Usually I'm not doing videos while I'm out having drinks with friends or something like that. It, it, it's simply, I just kind of keep them separated because I know that my topic is technology. So why would I incorporate something that's not really related to what my audience is there to see? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So at the moment, I, um, my business is not a corporation. I haven't signed it up as an LLC or an S corporation or anything like that, which I do plan to do at some point. Um, it's sole proprietorship according to the law. That's what I sign up when I do my taxes. It's a sole proprietorship. Um, now, in terms of liability and everything like that, that's kind of up in the air because it's one of those things where the FTC has, FTC has these laws but there's so many influencers out there. Are they going through every single video and making sure that they're, they're really not. So there is a lot of that personal accountability. And, and as I said, well, if, as long as you're open and honest with your fans about everything, they see that and they, and, and they really respect that and um, respond very well 
to you being transparent to them and understand the need for sponsored content. Yeah. How do you see the role of the uh, influencer evolving? Very rapidly. Uh, influencers are something that a lot of companies didn't pay attention to three, four years ago. Uh, and because I don't think, because it's new and it's something companies didn't quite understand and didn't understand that you could really reach a very vast audience through YouTube, through social media as well, and influence a lot of people and, and, and their core audience. Since, since mine is mainly technology, companies say, oh, you're, you're four, 380,000 subscribers all like technology. So I have a technology product. Why would I advertise on TV where it's a wide range of people that might not care about technology? and go to a direct source of people that like technology. So I think as time goes on, more and more companies are really going to see the benefit of advertising through influencers. And this is something that I think the consumer needs to be aware of because if people aren't disclosing they're getting paid, you could run into the problem of buying a product that an influencer recommended and it not being a very good product. That's, and then they won't, you won't, probably won't go back to that person. But as it, as it advances more and more, I, I'm curious to see what the FTC is going to do, if they're going to crack down even more. I haven't seen any action from them past those 90 letters they sent out to people on Instagram, but I can definitely foresee them stepping in more and starting to actually hold people accountable to what they're saying in their videos and making sure they're really being transparent about the sponsorships. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Uh, MKBHD is up there. He's, um, he makes some very quality videos. Very nice guy. I've met him a couple times. Um, there's, a, I have a good core following of smaller YouTubers. Uh, Danny, Danny Winget's one of them. I wouldn't say small. They're, they're very big, but, uh, and realistically, I don't watch that many tech videos on YouTube. Um, mainly the reason behind that is because I like to get my information on my own with reviewing a product. I don't want my opinion kind of formed by someone else's opinion and I want to have my own genuine opinions. And I think my, my fan base respects that. So I'm not kind of repeating something someone else is already saying. So I kind of try and stay away from watching tech videos in general. Um, I've made a lot of friends with them. So it, I'm kind of biased because I'm just friends with them. So I like their channels. Uh, but realistically I don't watch that many tech videos. Roger. How do you uh, make a video be more viral or less viral? <laughs> uh, I wish it was that easy to just have some sort of formula to make a video viral. There's really not. Uh, there's definitely things that you can know about in terms of the YouTube platform or the social media platform and the specific keywords to use. Um, and that's something that I've learned over time. And I'm at the point now where when I post a video, I can give a very accurate estimate of how many views a video would get. Um, just based on how popular it is at the time, my timing of the upload. Um, for example, if I, had, I think I did an unboxing video on the new Galaxy Note 8 and Samsung sent me that early. So I got that video out a little bit early and earlier than other YouTubers might have. And that video has close to 3 million views now. So it's just, and I knew that was gonna happen because I was, had access to the device early. Um, and, and of course, using the right keywords, you have tags on YouTube and that's the whole process. I actually would be interested in writing up a talk on that as well. Cause there's a lot that goes into it behind the scenes on YouTube and knowing what keywords to use and how to actually bump yourself up on these search results and relating related videos on the side as well. Yeah. How's the new iPhone? <laughs> it's good. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I do like it. I, I, I've been impressed with the new face unlock feature. Uh, it works. It doesn't work when I wear my sunglasses, which is a bit unfortunate. But other than that, it's um, it's my definitely way better than the iPhone 8. Um, so yeah, it's been good. My review will come out soon if you want to watch it. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. And um, and so there's a little bit more. I know it's not good to listen to culture uh, there in the one hundred. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you.
Thank you, guys. Yes. Casey, nice to meet you. I went to high school with Tom Schofield.